Virtue ethics is, well, it's, it's a little different from the rest of the theories that we're going to look at. Most of the ethical theories are going to give you, or are going to give you some kind of valuation of action. Um, they're going to tell you, they're going to have some, some claim as to what the right or wrong act is supposed to be. And, you know, that's good as far as it goes. I mean, ethical theory is supposed to be a guide to action. It's supposed to tell us what course of action to take. Virtue ethics is, I mean, it's kind of like that, but there's a real big difference. It, there is, there is going to be something to say about action. But a big part of virtue ethics is uh, not only saying what is the right action to do, what is the good action, but what kind of person to be? What is a good person? And this can get really sticky real fast. Real sticky real fast. So this is one important key difference to keep in, to keep in mind. Is that virtue ethics asks the question of what kind of person to be. We should probably start with the definition of a virtue. I usually like to work up to the definition and, and explain why we have that definition, but I think it, in this case it's helpful to go kind of backwards. Now, a virtue, as the book is defining, is a trait of character manifested by habitual action that is good for a person to have. A trait of character manifested by, by habitual action that is good for a person to have. That's a mouthful. And this is, this is why I say, you know, uh, uh, et, you know, virtue ethics does look at action. It really does look at action, but not just action. There's more involved in it than that. Um, now, what's interesting here is there's some kind of implicit claim that the trait of a character is going to determine the action. And we'll, you know, keep a, a finger on that one. We'll want to return to that and see what that means later on. And, you know, a real question here is, well, what does it mean for it to be good for a person to have? That's another question that's going to come up. So, uh, put your finger on those, but we, uh, but uh, also keep in mind that, you know, this definition of a virtue is a trait of character manifested by habitual action that is good for a person to have. So before really diving deep into you know, an extensive <laughs> discussion of what virtues are, it's probably helpful to start with one or two examples. I'm not going to go through the laundry list of examples in the book. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily on, on two. Now one question that I think immediately comes up is, you know, how do you know uh, what's a virtue? So what we're asking here is, how do we know which dispositions of character produce these you know habitual actions that are that are good for us it's like well there's there's already one idea already embedded in our culture when we talk about this and that's health right? health is a virtue in our culture it's good for us to be healthy it's good for us to be healthy so a question very quickly becomes and I imagine you're asking right now so what is healthy how do we figure this out well uh, uh, Aristotle thought that there was a really kind of a handy way to start figure out what the virtues are and that was through what he called the golden mean. And it was the uh, point between the, ex between the two vices, right? There are vices of excess and vices of deficiency. So when we're talking about health, what kinds of actions are we talking about? We're talking about eating, and we're talking about exercise, and we're probably talking about uh, you know, medical care of some kind or another. <laughs> um, so we can we can really quickly start thinking of excesses of eating, you know, spending three days at the all-you-can-eat buffet. That that's an excess. <laughs> uh, you know, deficiency is you know kind of go the other direction where you're uh, not eating for three days, where you're just having water or crust of bread or something like this. Well, then golden mean is is going to be between that. Now it's probably going to take some work, right? Where you you, you try to figure out exactly what's too much or too little. This is a hot topic for debate in our, in, in our culture. You know, just the number of meals and size of meals to, uh, uh, in a day. You know, the one standard model is three uh, meals, three, you know, quote-unquote full meals, 
Another model is six smaller meals. That's, there's a debate between those. Uh, so this, you know, so trying to figure out that, you know, that middle point between the excess and the deficiency, that, that's the golden mean, and it takes work. Uh, same thing with exercise. You can, uh, you know, the, an extreme deficiency is not moving at all. <laughs> you know, becoming very much a, a part of your couch. <laughs> that would be a deficiency of exercise. You know, an excess is, you know, running yourself into a heart attack. You know, running all day, every day, and, and not stopping. That would be an excess. So the golden mean is somewhere in the middle there. Well, that, that's the idea for health. Well, we can apply this to, um, uh, to other kinds of dispositions. So, for instance, courage or bravery. Right? This has its excess and it has its deficiency. You know, the excess is, you know, supposing I'm confronted with 20 guys and out here in the middle of the park and they want to take my camera. I was like, well, you know, I wield my water bottle as a weapon. Uh, I'm going to take you all on. Well, that would be an excess <laughs> of trying to handle that situation. You know, thinking, you know, being very overconfident in my abilities to handle 20 guys. Yeah. You know, a deficiency would be, uh, you know, maybe something like uh, saying, okay, well, here's my camera, here's my wallet, here's my hat, here are my clothes. And by the way, would you like to beat me a few times before you leave? Right? That would probably be some kind of, um, you know, deficiency. And, you know, the, you know, the courage part might be somewhere in the middle, right? Um, you know, in that situation, probably, you know, leaving behind the camera and taking off is probably the, actually the courageous thing to do because you're being so outnumbered. Um, now, if it's just one person, well, you know, then maybe there's a difference there. Maybe there's a difference. So, you know, this is how we start to find these virtues. We start to find this golden mean between the excess and the deficiency. In addition to, you know, the action, there is this, this trait of character. Right? So, we're getting at the motivation for the action. Why do we perform that action? So, for instance, um, you know, a real, you know, we again, we already kind of load this into our culture. We already have some really clear ideas about this. You know, we tend to think that a really poor reason to pursue health is, uh, you know, merely for the sake of vanity, merely for the sake of looking good. It's not that looking good is a bad thing, but if that's your only reason, if you're not pursuing health for the sake of being healthy, we tend to think that the reasoning is off, that there's something missing, there's an improper motivation. Um, so, not only the kind of action, but the motivation for the action. And maybe a way of saying that is, you know, once we've identified the good, then wanting the good for the sake of the good. So, wanting to be healthy because it's healthy, as opposed to wanting to be healthy for the sake of vanity. We can start going into other examples, um, but that'll, I think, suffice for the moment. So this, this gets us an idea as to what these virtues are. It's you know, this mean between the deficiency and the excess. And it's you know, these reasons, it's these motivations that dispose us to perform that golden mean in the variety of situations. Well, very quickly, some questions are going to arise as to whether these virtues are the same for everybody. Now, there, there's going to be a lot of variation, all right? Um, you know, my golden mean for courage is probably going to be something very different than, say, your average trained Marine. <laughs> you know, your average trained Marine might be able to take on those 20 guys and not be foolish. You know, the trained Marine has got lots of training and strength and knows how to handle that situation. So, what's going to determine the right action here? Well, that, that's hard. Right? There is going to be some variation between people. Similarly, there's going to be variation between cultures. So, we might be tempted to say that we're you know, right back with moral relativism all over again, since the virtues are going to vary from person to person. And, I mean, you know, kind of, sort of, there's going to be some uh, actions that are going to be virtuous and some reasons that are going to be virtuous depending upon uh, the person. But the fact of the matter is, and I don't think Rachel emphasizes this enough, there are going to be same virtues simply because we are all people. We are all people. There is something of what it means to be a person. There's something of what it means to be a human being. So think back to health. So there is going to be some variation between people, but that doesn't mean that it's completely relative. No, of course there's variation, but that doesn't mean that there's 
this fundamental difference because we are all people. Right? We are there are some fundamentally same things about all of us. What it means to be a person, what it means to be a human being. So even just looking at health, um, you know, it, you know, my target heart rate is about 144, right? That's supposed to be my, uh, uh, I'm sorry, no, that's the high end. <laughs> Between 117 and 144, that's my target heart rate. Now that's going to differ from people, from uh, you know, people that are younger than me, and you know, some people that are older than me. Um, but there's still that range, there's still that commonality why there is that range. Nobody's target heart rate is 10. You would be dead. Nobody's target heart rate is 350. Again, you would be, well, I don't know, that might be high. Let's say 800. Let's say 800. You'd be dead by then. Now, the reason why there is that range, even amongst a variety, is because we are all human beings. There is that commonality. So we looked at two ideas here that we come to know the virtues by finding this golden mean. You know, this is a process of discovery. And yeah, you have to go out and discover it. Um, but at the same time, the, you know, the range of the virtues, what's going to count as a virtue, is going to have a common uh, defining point. And, and that's because of what we are. Right? What does it mean to, to be human? What does it mean to be a person? Now, there are some advantages to this. To virtue ethics, and since we uh, do load in the idea of of reason, and we do I load in the idea of character traits, it seems like virtue ethics um, avoids some problems about uh, doing the right thing for the wrong reason. Now, you, you might be wondering what this is. Well, you know, suppose um, I don't know. Suppose you're friendly to uh, suppose yeah. Suppose you're friendly to uh, a coworker. And you know you talk to the code worker, you find out the coworker's interests, and you come to know what the coworker is like. Right. Now, one reason to do this is because you care about your coworker. You want to know what another human being is like. You want to be humane. You want to make a connection. Right. Maybe you want to work together. So, you know where your interests and their interests uh, line up, and where you want to um, be able to be more productive as a team. We tend to think of these as, as good reasons, what it means to be a human being, a good human being in this case. Uh, but you could do it for other reasons too. You could find out what your coworker is like for the purpose of manipulating the coworker to do what you want. Now, it doesn't even necessarily mean harming the coworker, you just, you know, be able to persuade the coworker to do what you want that coworker to do. Maybe for their own benefit, that's fine. So, so again, we're kind of talking about this idea of selfishness, and we were related to with uh, ethical egoism. We think selfishness is, is kind of a bad reason, a, a, a dishonorable reason, a distasteful reason uh, to do things. You know, um, you know, marrying marrying a person for social status doesn't seem like a good reason. And we think that if you marry somebody, you you uh, ought to marry that person because you love that person. It's the same act, marrying, marrying all other things considered equal is good, but the difference is um, the motivation, the reason. So in this much, we think that virtue ethics gets it right, that there's a certain vantage where virtue ethics gets at the character, doing the right thing for the right reason. Now this isn't to deny that you, you can't do the wrong thing for the right reason, sure, right? We, we think that there's doing the wrong thing for the right reason. But with this much as far as motivation is concerned, we think virtue ethics gets this right. So, another thing that virtue ethics tends to get right is dealing with impartiality. Now, when we're dealing with theories you know, that just cover actions, we don't deal with reasons or motivations at all. So, uh, when we're, so, you know, so you, sometimes it seems kind of weird in some situations where you know you save somebody's life because you're obligated to save their life. Like, well, or you know, suppose you rescue your spouse from a fate worse than death, and your spouse says, "Wow, thank you so much for saving my life." And then you say, "Well, you know, I had a moral obligation to save your life." Like, Ooh, 
It's gonna be silence at dinner that night, right? <laughs> you know, virtue ethics tends to get this right. It's like, well, I saved your life because I love you. Right? Uh, so, when well, one of the things that virtue ethics tends to get right is is this idea of the right motivations for actions. Right? Now, related to that is uh, dealing with impartiality. Now, when Rachel first gave this condition for impartiality, is you know everybody's interests are considered equal, and you know, nobody really balked at that, but I think you're probably thinking of maybe a legal or, or setting like that, but there are plenty of situations where uh, you, are in, you are biased and you should be biased. You know, if you have two people in front of you and they each have a headache and one person's headache is worse than another, you, know, you probably ought to give, and you have like one dose of aspirin, you, you ought to give that dose of aspirin to the person who has the worst headache. Like, okay, well, no big deal. But suppose uh, the two people uh, are, are not just two people. Suppose one of the people is, you know, your, your young child. And another person is a, uh, you know, an adolescent of somebody else's. Right? So your child and somebody else's child. This blanket statement about impartiality would say, well, you know, you ought to consider their interests equally. It's like, no! <laughs> you know, in situations like that, you ought to consider your child's interest to be more important. That's your child. There's a relationship there. So, this idea of uh, um, that virtue ethics gets the right motivation down is strongly linked to the idea that virtue ethics gets the right impart gets the right ideas down about impartiality. So virtue ethics has its advantages, but it still has its murky areas. And one of the things that uh, Rachel points at is, you know, with this definition of virtue, you know, we're asking ourselves, well, what is, well, what is, what is good? What is goodness? And you say, well, what is goodness? And the answer is, it's virtue. And the question is, well, what's virtue? And the answer is, well, it's that character trait manifested by habitual action that's good for a person to have. To which you say, great, what's goodness? And the answer is, it's virtue. Very quickly, you see how this kind of devolves into a circle. <laughs> what's goodness? Well, it's virtue. Well, what's virtue? Well, it involves goodness. And you know, that doesn't help. So yeah, there could be some real problems there trying to figure that out. Now, what I don't think Rachel does enough work doing, is he kind of just leaves it as mysterious and walks away. It's like, well, you know, in his own uh, description of what a virtue is, he, he has the answer. You know, it's not... It's not the clearest answer, but it's it's the way to start figuring that answer. And you know, we start figuring what virtues are. It's well, it's it's what's good for a person. How do we know what that is? Well, we got to know what a person is. But there is something fundamental to what being a person is. We already have this idea regarding health. We have a lot of descriptions about what health is, and you know, we have a lot of description of what the body is. And this doesn't stop us from figuring out what healthy is. We have this range of what health is. Um, same thing with any kind of emotional health. Right? There are some commonalities of what it means to be a person and what it means to be a person with a mind and emotions. And we are, we are able to start figuring out what this, what, this is, what this goodness is, to have this kind of uh, goodness of what it means to be a person. Uh, and this comes from this common definition, this common uh, this, this this definition of what it means to be human. Right? So it's not quite as far fetched out there. It's not like we can just pick any notion of good or just supply, you know put it into the virtues. Like no, there's there's something of what it means to be a person. And yeah, that's a lot of hard work trying to figure out what that is. And there's a lot of theories about what trying to figure that is. But that doesn't mean that whatever virtue is is just up in the air. There's just kind of a lot of blank spots <laughs> and if we want to answer that question if we want to figure out what the good life is we got to figure out what we are and when you're doing that you're doing metaphysics so your one worry about virtue ethics is trying to figure out what this goodness is and 
like I said, we, we apparently don't have much of a problem trying to figure out at least a range of what healthy is. And, uh, you know, uh, as far as physical health is concerned and what health is as far as the uh, uh, emotional health is concerned. And you know, we do the same thing when we start talking about an uh, in intellectual life and we have a range of what we think uh, a person ought to, ought to know. Now, it doesn't mean that's beyond reproach and beyond question. It doesn't mean there's still not a whole lot of hard work, but it's there. You know, it is a process of discovery, trying to figure out what we are and trying to figure out how we're supposed to function how we're supposed to, you know, be what, we're, what we are. Another problem that kind of pops up for virtue ethics is uh, what, we, what we might call uh, a problem of indecision. Right? So remember, an ethical theory is supposed to be action guiding. It's supposed to tell us what course of action to take. All right. Now, a problem with uh, virtue ethics is that we're just dealing with not just dealing, but we're dealing with character traits. We're dealing with character dispositions. And sometimes it seems like these dispositions can conflict with one another. So we might talk about, um, oh, I don't know, uh, honesty and courage. Right? Now, there's some cases where uh, the courageous thing is to lie. <laughs> yeah, the courageous thing is to lie. Um, so, you know, think of a situation like this where, uh, um, you know, a murderer comes to your door and uh, threatens your life if you don't tell the murderer where your um, family is so that the murderer can go and murder your family. Now, a very cowardly thing to do in that situation is to tell the truth <laughs> and to tell the murderer where your family is and let the murderer go murder your family All right that's a very cowardly thing to do um, you know a brave thing to do is to is to lie and to risk <laughs> the discovery of lying you know maybe even to try to trap the murderer or defend your family right and you say you lie and you say well um, you know my family is out of town this week and they, uh, they're two states across, so, you know, they're at this address, if you hurry now, maybe you can go catch them before you, they leave and come back here. You know, that'd be a complete lie, All right? They're all hiding in your closet or something like this. So there's sometimes where it looks like the virtues can conflict. And so what's needed here is some kind of hierarchy of the virtues, you know, which virtues are more important than others. And, so, and that, that's, that's a lot of hard work, and there have been lots of attempts to do that. And these are the, the two main problems then with uh, virtue ethics is, you know, trying to define what the good is and trying to define, you know, trying to, you know, solve this problem of indecision or maybe what we might call conflicting uh, virtues.